Yes, Mr. Millett. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the panel. Uh, I now invite Mr. Danny Freeman, QC, to come back to the podium, please, to make the presentation on behalf of the uh, family from Flat 192, who sheltered in Flat 193. And the members of the family are Hashim Kadir, Nura Jamal, Yahya Hashim, Fadoz Hashim, and Yakub Hashim. Uh, and before I continue, shall I also give the trigger Please. warning in the normal way? Um, those here today or those watching on the live stream may find uh, what Mr. Friedman is going to tell us or show us disturbing and distressing, and they may wish to leave now or to look away from the live stream, as the case may be. Mr. Thank Friedman. you. Yes. Nura Jamal, Hashim Kadir, and their children, Yahya, Fardus, and Yakub, lived in flat 192 on what became the 22nd floor after the refurbishment. The family moved to Grenfell Tower in 2009. All five of the family died in flat 193, together with the Shukare family members. But can I begin by dealing with each person's date birth and details, and I will do so in order of age. Hashim Kadir was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, on the 7th of March, 1973, and was 44 years old at the time of his death. He was a black cab taxi driver. His wife, Noura Jamal, was born in Silat, in Ethiopia, on the 1st of August, 1981. She was 35 years old. The couple had three children born in London. Yahya Hashim was born on the 5th of August 2003. He was 13 years old and a pupil of Kensington Aldridge Academy. His sister, Fardus Hashim, was born on the 13th of June to January 2005. She was 12 years old. She also attended Kensington Aldridge Academy. Their brother, Yakub Hashim, was born on the 18th of May 2011. He was six years old. He went to Avondale Park Primary School. On the 25th of May 2018, commemorations were given by and on behalf of Hashim Kadir's siblings. They are Asma, Shemsu, Redwan, Fatuma, Bedria, Mohammed, Merima, and Jamal, as well as Asma's daughters. Hanan and Aliza Said, and Rezwan's sons, Ramadan and Habib. Commemorations were also given by and on behalf of Nura Jamal's sisters and brothers. They are Bidreya, Nuria, Sadiq, Fedlu, Mahamud, Jamal, and Senya. A moving video presentation was played. So you heard that Nura Jamal was born in a small village in rural Silt in Ethiopia. At the age of just 14, she moved to the city Addis Ababa to work to support her family. From there, she moved to Saudi Arabia and later to the United Kingdom, where she met and married Hashim. She remained dedicated to her extended family in Ethiopia and a source of indispensable moral, emotional and financial support. Nura Jamal was described to you as intelligent, positive-minded and devout a wonderful mother. She was also a very social person who would befriend anyone, no matter their background or beliefs. Hashim Kadir was also born in Ethiopia, the smartest boy in the school growing up. 
He repeatedly topped his class and went on to study electrical engineering before coming to the United Kingdom. But Hashim was also a humble person. He was remembered for being soft-hearted, generous, and with the widest smile a person could have. He loved football and was a big Arsenal fan, something he enjoyed sharing with his children, especially his eldest, Yaya. There were no limits to what he would do for his family. He prioritised providing for them over his, over his dream of further studies, taking a variety of jobs over the years. He had obtained his London black, black cab taxi licence shortly before the fire, which was going to be a new chapter for him and the family. Hashim also maintained close and dear relationships with his family members in Norway, the USA, and Ethiopia. Yahya Hashim was the eldest child. He was a student in year nine. He was described to you as a very kind, polite, loving, generous, and thankful boy. He inherited his, his mum's love and respect for their religion, Islam, and unusually for a child his age, dreamed of becoming an ustas, an Islamic teacher. He also wanted to make sure everyone around him was okay. He loved laughing and making others laugh by a silly song or funny grimace and would succeed in having people in stitches. He was full of character. Fardus Hashim was in year seven at the Kensington and Chelsea Academy, which he, where she excelled in her studies as well as a range of extracurricular activity. She was described to you as a beautiful, intelligent, eloquent, and confident person. A voracious reader, she would get through six books from the library over a weekend. She was also a gifted public speaker, and as you heard, was awarded a prize by Bill Gates for the best floor speech in the final of a countrywide public speaking competition. After the fire, the journalist John Snow one of the other judges poignantly recalled how she had stood out above everybody else. If that wasn't enough, she also had a beautiful singing voice. But as you heard, Fadus was also humble, kind and grateful for what she and her community had. Sir, you saw a glimpse of Fadus's talent for yourself in a video which captured her singing at her school, a beautiful song by Emily Sande called Read All About It. Its lyrics encourage people to speak their truth. The first line is, you've got the words to change a nation. In the film, as they sing along and wildly cheer, for Deuce's friends and schoolmates are evidently captured by the charisma of this young girl who, like her brother Yahya, had unusual leadership qualities. Last but not least, Yakub Hashim, the youngest, was by all accounts a ball of pure energy. Always on the move, he loved to dance. You heard how his spirit was contagious. It was impossible to spend a minute with him without laughing. He was loved alike by teachers and peers at Avon Park Primary School. His teacher recalled how he would burst through the door of the classroom in the morning and shout, I'm here. Panel, the commemorations make it so very clear that the three children of Nura and Hashim left their mark. We have taken some time to recall what was said about these people, not just out of respect to them, but also to relay the strength of their characters and to provide some context for how they would have experienced the events of the fire. The family were captured on the CCTV of the lift lobby for the last time during the afternoon and night of the 13th of June. Fadus Hashim came home at 15.50. Nura Jamal came with Yakub Hashim at 18.29. Yahya Hashim arrived home at 20.36. Finally, Hashim Qadir returned at 23.21. From an emergency call from floor four, just before 1 a.m., the fire at Grenfell Tower rapidly reached floor 22 before 0126. Even before that time, various residents on floor 22 quickly became aware of the fire. Naomi Lee, 
in flat 195 began to smell smoke in her flat as early as 1.15 and made calls to both her husband and the LFB about it. Naomi and her cousin Lydia Lowe then saw the El Guaris on their landing who told them there was a fire in their kitchen in flat 196. Shortly after, Naomi and Lydia began sheltering in flat 193 where the Hashim Qadir and Noura Jamal family would later join them having been invited into the home by Nadia Shuker. I have addressed you this morning on calls between 1.30 and 1.40 to control room operators from various occupants on floor 22, informing them that the fire had adversely affected that high floor. You will hear more, data, more detail tomorrow um, about these calls, um, particularly from Anthony Disson. For present purposes, at 01308, Mr. Disson from flat 194 explained to the control room that conditions were bad on the floor and was assured, we're on our way, to which he replied, I'll tell all the rest. Naomi Lee called the control room and made a similar call at 013038 to say that conditions on their floor had worsened. There's all smoke now, she said, and that her neighbour had told her that the fire was in the kitchen on floor 22. In that sequence of calls at 01.34.50, Hashim Kadir connected to the control room for the first time from his home. He told CRO Duddy that he and his family were in flat 192, that they couldn't get down the stairs because the stairs are full of smoke, and that smoke was now coming into the flat from the corridor. Pausing there, this might be another example of the events on floor 16, including the rescuing of Edward Daffan and the inability to rescue Joseph Daniels, causing smoke to fill the stairway for that temporary but decisive period. While on the phone, Hashem Kadir was told by the operator that people were coming to them, but was asked nothing about how many were in their group or about the profile of the occupants. At 0143, Jeno Shalwa, in flat 153 on the 18th floor, with her husband Paulus Teko and two children, called her friend Nura Jamal. Hashim picked up the phone. Hashim told Jene that they were sitting with the children, waiting for the fire services to come and rescue them. As I noticed this morning, in none of these calls were the occupants of floor 22 advised to evacuate, and in none of the calls were details taken to establish whether that was possible. Service requests were made and passed to the fire ground following the earlier calls from floor 22. In outline, a control request referred to, quote, persons on 22nd floor smoke coming into flat. It was completed on the log at 014135. There was a radio message to various LFB pumps between 0135 and 0136 that stated, we've got persons on the 22nd floor with smoke coming into their flat. The Sadler list of handwritten flats with numbers drawn up between approximately 0140 and 150 referred to flat 195, but no other flats on floor 22. And at 2.09, the control room called through to command unit 8 to indicate, quote, we've got a caller in flat 192 on the 22nd floor unable to leave. This call appears to link to the call between Hashim Kadir and CRO Duddy at 01.34. Panel, we know that after this, no deployments were specifically made to the floor for the purposes of rescue until after 3.03, at which time, watch manager De Silva deployed firefighter, firefighters Cod and Joseph. They, as you know, did not get to the floor. Neither did any other crew during the whole night of the fire, save for firefighter Roberts of the Paddington crew, who tasked for firefighting and not rescue purposes, tallied out from the bridgehead at 0156. He got to the lobby door of floor 22, where he says he, quote, opened the door to the floor, stuck his head in, 
shouted out but received no response from anybody, so he went back down. There is no evidence that his presence registered with any of the multiple remaining occupants on floor 22 at the time. Can I deal with the calls from floor 22 before 0240 and particularly those from flat 192? For context, please bear in mind that multiple calls were made from floor 22 in the second hour of the fire. For these purposes, I will focus on the calls from floor from 192, the Hashim and Noura family, but we would also ask you to consider that there were calls from Anthony Disson, the Shoecare family, and Naomi Lee and Lydia Lowe. Hashim Kadir called the control room from flat 192 at 020347. When asked, he said, there was too much smoke in the corridor and we can't get out. Although he was assured that the firefighters would be told you're there, he was not asked about numbers or occupancy profile, which would have confirmed the presence of three children. The trapped status of the caller was confirmed in a call to Command Unit 8 at 020925, in which it was relayed that, quote, we've got a caller in flat 192 on the 22nd floor, unable to leave. Fardus Hashim was put through to BT at 20946. She can be heard to scream that there's a fire in our house and that there were three kids. The call was then put through to the LFB at 021031, during which Hashim Kadir came onto the line and told CRO Housen that he was in flat 192 and that, quote, there's a fire in the kitchen. He repeated this on several occasions and could be heard telling others to get down. There is a 23 second delay while the operator said she would speak with the crews at the scene. When the operator again came on the line, Hashim repeated, the fire is inside the kitchen and that everybody's coughing now, to which he was told they were advising people to stay in their flats. But if you've got a fire in your flat, it's your decision. You may have to try to get out. The caller said he was trapped and that there were children, heard by the operator as two adults, five children before the line went dead. At 021717, BT sent a message to the Metropolitan Police Service stating that we have received a number of calls from people trapped on the 22nd floor. There is no evidence as to whether this was passed to the LFB command unit. A further call came from through to LFB from Hashem Kadir at 0218 06. He stated at the beginning of the call, as can be heard on the tape you've listened to, we need to move to next door. At that stage, he was still in flat 192. Sir, may I ask for a break? I'm thinking it should be 15 minutes. I think that would be a good idea. Thank you very much. We'll rise until 25 to Three, thank you.
Yes, Mr Friedman. Sir, thank you for the time. A further call came through to the LFB from Hashim Qadir at 02.18.06. He stated at the beginning of the call, as can be heard on the tape if listened to, we need to move next door. At that stage, he was still in flat 192. CRO Housen, again the operator, asked him, who's in the flat with you? To which he confirmed two adults and three children. During the course of the call, a sound of banging can be heard, as well as someone calling Nadia, and thereafter Nadia and Bassam. That must presumably be Hashim and Noura's family banging on the door and calling to their neighbours, Mr and Mrs Shukair. At the end of the call, Hashim Qadir was informed by the CRO that they're making their way there now. A radio message from control to command unit at 02.26.22 indicated that there were persons trapped in flat 192, floor 22, who say the fire is in the flat next door to them. Command replied asking whether it was known how many people were in the flat, to which the message came back in the negative. At 02.24, Hindi, a friend of Noura Jamal called LFB control to say that her friend with her three children and husband were in the building and, they, they were, and that they were burning. The information was passed on to the police and the control room at 02.30.51. At 02.33.22, Hashim Qadir connected with BT Exchange. A child screaming can be heard on the recording. The call was put through to CRO Housen at 02.34.16, and Hashim told her that they were still in flat 192, that they were three kids and two adults, and that the fire was now in the living room. For the first time, Hashim was told clearly to leave the flat. The operator's words were, quote, what you need to do, you need to get wet towels, you need to put them around your mouth, you and the children, and you need to go down, all right? It's going to be dark and that, so you need to stay together, hold hands, all right, but keep your mouth covered, all right? She said she would let the crews know what's going on. During the course of the call, a female supervisor in the control room can be heard to prompt this evacuation advice. Fadush Hashim made another call at 02503 and passed the phone on to her mother, Noura Jamal, when they got through to the MPS operator. During the call, while crying, Nora told them that she was in flat 192 with her husband and three children. She asked about rescue by helicopter. At this stage, she said the fire was in the sitting room and coming through to the bedroom, she begged, please save us, my kids, please. The police operator duly called CRO Russell at 024146 to let them know of the two adults and three children in flat 192 and that there was a fire in the living room. Hashim Qadir subsequently called the LFB control room again at 024522 to indicate that they had tried to get out but could not and that they were dying. CRO Fox implored them to get out of the property now, and she could be heard to be urged to advise the same by a supervisor. On the tape, you can hear the family go out and then come back in, with the caller then saying, I try to get out, but I'm afraid to. The family was still in flat 192 at 025317 when CRO Jones took a call from Hashim. The caller told the operator, we are in 192 Grenfell Tower. CRO Jones advised them to try to leave. You heard this morning of the numerous calls that the occupants of flat 193 recommenced making from around 0235. I will not repeat the shoe care calls now, but please recall them in the period as all coming from floor 22 at a similar time. Likewise, as I showed you this morning, various references to people in need of rescue 
were written on the board of the command unit, 7, by 03 a.m., and then on the ground floor wall at the entrance to the tower by sometime after 0315. We know of the one crew who was sent to floor 22 at 0309 and that they found Naomi Lee and Lydia Lowe who had escaped from flat 193 on their way down from the floor. You will see that the escape was after the Hashim and Noura family had entered the flat and joined them and the Shukair family. The women came out of the tower at 0321. Both Naomi Lee and her husband Lee Chapman told firefighters at the scene and the police over the phone that 10 people were left in flat 193. 10 persons, or 10p, was the detail written on the ground floor wall in Grenfell Tower. In fact, we know that there were 11 people. The grandma, the husband and wife, and the three Shukair children are now Hashim Qadir, Noura Jamal, Yaya, Fardus and Yarkub. The phase one report concluded at volume three, paragraph 16.51, that it was likely that the Hashim and Noura family relocated from flat 192 to flat 193 before 3 a.m. and that they were certainly there by 0307. From this moment, the narrative of the Shukair family, which you heard about this morning, and that of the Hashim and Nura family come together. At 0.59.29, police helicopter footage captured a person at the southwest corner living room of flat 193, waving their hand and the information was communicated to the police operators as people on the balcony, southwest corner, second floor from the top. Footage in the next few minutes, as I have summarized, shows two people leaning out of the window and smoke coming out of the flat. Basim Shukair called BT Exchange at 030147. He said, please, we are dying, guys, we're dying. He was put through to the LFB at 030206. He asked CRO Housen to send a helicopter. She said, we can't rescue you with a helicopter and that they would have to leave. Her words, make your way to the stairwell. It's going to be dark. You can make your way along the wall, open the door very slowly, seeing what's going out, and make your way to the stairwell and walk down the stairs out of the building. But make sure you're all covered. Get yourself wet. Blankets, towels, you need to leave the building. Basim Shukair called BT Exchange again at 030434, telling them that they were dying and asking for a helicopter. He was put through to CRO Duddy, who told him to cover themselves with wet towels and get to the staircase, as that was the only option. He told Basim, I know the smoke, and I know it's going to be hard, but this is your only chance. Your only chance. Naomi Lee at this stage, still in flat 193, called the LFB at 030713. She told them there were 12 people now in the flat. That would be an error because there were 13. And that the smoke was really bad now. She was told to cover with wet blankets and make their way down. Prior to the call, Naomi had spoken to Lee Chapman, her husband in Malaysia. They discussed her and Lydia trying to leave in what might be their last chance. You heard this morning that they did do so after this call. Before they were to leave, Naomi was with Noura Jamal by the window when Noura asked her to pray with her. The final calls from flat 193 began at a point in time when Naomi Lee and Lydia Lowe must have exited. At 0308.13, a caller believed to be Hashim Qadir was put through to BT Exchange. When he was passed through to CRO Gotts, he asked, can we escape from the helicopter? Which he said he could see. She did not tell him that this could not happen. She told him that they were sending big ladders. During the call, someone, believed to be Nura Dumal or possibly Basim Shukair, could be heard to scream, we're burning, the fire is inside. CRR Gotts told the caller again that they were sending ladders. The caller said, if you send a helicopter, we can escape. 
The operator replied, all right, well, I'll pass that over to let them know where you are. At 0314, Nadia Shuker was put through to BT Exchange and implored them that we need a helicopter. She told them that her baby, presumably Zainab, was now unconscious. The BT operator told her to try to get out as quickly as they could. On being transferred to the control room at 031551, the call cut off, but someone else in the flat can be heard to shout, you need to go on the staircase. Are you listening, everyone? Is everyone listening? Right, we need to wet ourselves and go on the staircase. This likely indicated a further attempt to escape. At 321, Nadia Shuker was called by the MPS operator as a result of the previous call being cut off. The operator had been told the caller's name was Nadia. Upon her answering, he told her, Nadia, you need to escape by all means necessary. She told the operator that there was so much smoke, but he replied again, you're going to have to escape by all means necessary. At 032402, a final call began with Hashim Kadir using Nadia Shuker's phone to speak to CRO Duddy. It lasted just under 15 minutes. Hashim told the operator that they had tried to get out, but there was too much smoke, to which the operator made clear, this is your only chance. Hashim asked again whether they could send a helicopter, to which the reply was, no, there's no other way, you have to try. From listening to the tape, there appears to be some last effort, including discussion of the possibility of trying with the other family, but the caller repeatedly says, we are dying. Some of the last words heard on the recording, but not reflected in the transcript, are as follows. Operator, you need, you need to get to that staircase. Hashim Kadir, well, we can't. We can't even move to the other room. Yaya, I love you. Fardus, I love you. Noura, I love you. Yakub, I love you, okay? We will die together. We will die together. The tape indicates there was a Muslim declaration of faith. The control operator terminated the call at approximately 0339. Hashim was passed back through to the BT operator who asked him if he had finished his call with the fire service. On the recording, Hashim can be heard to muster a response of fire, fire. Forensic archeology span investigations recovered the remains of all of the Hashim Noura family in close proximity in the southwest corner of the living room of flat 193. Also very nearby were their neighbors and final givers of refuge, the Shukare family. As I drew attention to this morning, the archeological diagrams and photographs show the adults close to the children in something of a protective circle. It's unnecessary to bring these up, but they are powerful because they undeniably indicate the family died close together and tightly bound to protect one another as reflected in the final telephone call. Professor Purser links the final rapid period of deterioration in the conditions in flat 193 to the spread of the external fire across the area where the living room was situated after around 337. Professor Purser initially estimated in section six of his phase two report that the adults in flat 193 would have lost consciousness sometime around 411 to 413 and died a few minutes later. He explained generally that the young children would likely have become unconscious earlier, closer to around 0353 and died soon after. This would include Yakub, age six. It now follows from Professor Purser's oral evidence that Yaya and Fadouche, aged 13 and 12, would likely have lost consciousness and died slightly earlier than their parents. 
The reference is 296, 109, 9 to 12. In fact, as with the Shukare family, there was an additional exposure to smoke which shifts back the Hashim Nura family's likely time of unconsciousness and death to slightly earlier than Professor Purser's initial estimates. As was explored with him in his oral evidence, the family experienced a period of approximately 15 minutes of exposure to toxic fire fumes in flat 192, prior to relocating to flat 193. This was the source of a significant addition to the family's total exposure of fumes. And that is dealt with at transcript 297, page 59 to page 63. Professor Purser concluded that the Hashim Nura family would have become unconscious, then died from the effects of inhalation of toxic fire fumes before the interior of the flat came to be on fire. Based on this evidence, the medical cause of death for all members of the family can properly be given as the more specific and informative formulation of inhalation of fire fumes or some similar wording, rather than the generic formulation of consistent with the effects of fire currently found in four of the five final post-mortem reports for the family, completed without the benefit of Professor Purser's specialist evidence. The final post-mortem report for Verdus Hashim already contains the more specific medical cause of death. That of itself illustrates how these matters can be framed differently by different pathologists, even at the preliminary stage. However, the formulation we now suggest is based on all available evidence at the end of a fact-finding process and not at the preliminary stage as required by the formality of filling in the post-mortem reports prior to the in-depth investigations that have now taken place. Can I end by sharing that during our time working on the inquiry, so many people in the tower and local area have spoken so very fondly of this family. Both the parents and their children really did light up many lives. A light has gone out for all these family members and friends who have lost them. People can and must connect to this inquiry in different ways, but it is worth mentioning that Sadiq and Bidreya, the brother and sister of Nura Jamal, and Shemsu, the brother of Hashim Kadim, have come from Ethiopia and attended this inquiry on the vast number of its several hundred hearing days. All of the family from around the world found the months of long wait for identification and burial and the condition of the remains of their loved ones reduced to ashes despite the religious prohibition on crem cremation intensely traumatizing. To this day, they find it impossible to properly grieve, and this will remain so until the long and complex inquiry and all the other legal processes that wait upon its conclusion reach a just resolution. We know that the panel know this, but it is worth taking the opportunity to reflect on this family's experience and what it is like for them from their perspective five years on to only now be at the end of the beginning. Can I end at this stage with words from Bedria Jamal Kabetu? Until the end of my life, from the bottom of my heart, I will never forget Hashim, Nura, and the children. We will never stop praying for you. Thank you, sir.
May I ask for a 30-minute break, please? Thank you very much, Mr. Friedman. Yes, of course, we'll rise now and we'll sit again at 25 past three. Thank you very much.
Yes, Mr. Millett. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the panel. I would now invite Alison Munro, Queen's Counsel, please to come to the podium to make the presentation on behalf of the family of Gary Maunders, who died in flat 203 on floor 23. Again, before I ask uh, Ms. Munro to start, I should give a trigger warning. The material and things said in this presentation uh, may be distressing to those listening to it, uh, whether in the room or on the live stream, and therefore those who may feel distressed should either leave now or perhaps a little later or look away from the live stream. Ms. Munro, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mrs. Stefan, Mr. Atbor. I'd like to mention that we have with us today a number of members of Gary's family. We have, starting from the far end, Kenita, Chanel, Gary's nieces, and Anna, his former partner and mother to two of his children. There are also family members who are watching remotely. Thank you. In the course of this presentation this afternoon, we will not be hearing when Gary Maunders took up a tenancy at Grenfell Tower. We will not be hearing about which floor he lived on or which flat he lived in. We will not be hearing any of that because Gary Maunders was not a resident of Grenfell Tower. Gary was a West London boy born and bred. He had friends who he'd visit and socialize with who were residents of Grenfell Tower. And on that night, the 14th of June, 2017, that is exactly what Gary had been doing, visiting a friend, Debbie Lamperell, at Grenfell Tower. It was a visit from which Gary would never return. Gary was born on the 4th of January, 1960, in London, and lived in North Kensington all his life. He was the eldest of four children. He was the only boy, and he and his mother, Joan, shared a special bond. Gary was a much-loved son, brother, father, uncle, grandfather, granduncle, and friend. He was 57 years of age when he died, and he was survived by his mother, Joan, sisters, Lorraine, Tammy and Anne, and children Scott, Amy, Aaron, and his younger sister, who were just 14 and nine respectively at the time of the fire, his grandchildren, his nieces, Kenita and Chanel Spence, nephews, grandnephews, and grandnieces. Gary had many loves. One of his most passionate was the beautiful game, football. He was a talented player himself in his youth, and being a native of West London, there was only one team he could possibly follow, Manchester United. He supported them through the highs of the late 60s, the not so glory years of the 70s and 80s, and back to the heights of the treble, Premier League and Champion League success in the 90s and 2000s. Gary became a painter and decorator, and he had a thirst for learning. He was outgoing and quick-witted. At the commemoration hearings, the family spoke eloquently about the person that Gary was. For Gary, family was everything. Together with Anna, Gary had two youngest children. Anna recalled at those hearings how their early years as a couple were filled with happiness and laughter. Gary was a devoted and loving father to his children, and indeed he considered his children to be the greatest achievement of his life. He was physically and verbally very affectionate to them, and they knew how much he loved them as a result. Gary was the life and soul of everything he did, and everywhere he went, he had a great sense of humor. In her remembrance of Gary, his sister Tammy said, addressing her brother directly, I hope you're with dad, still nagging his ear off as you always did. 
Tammy paid special tribute to the bond that Gary and his mother had. She said that their mum always supported him and had his back. They spoke every day. In the video played at the commemoration hearing, his mother said that she would, he would make sure that everyone around him was always laughing and she felt you could never be sad, not when he was around. Tammy herself loved the relationship that Gary had with her own children and his fun-loving nature. He loved music and especially the legendary soul singer Marvin Gaye. His nieces, Kenita and Chanel, gave us a very, very vivid pen portrait at that commemoration hearing. They told us that Gary was a man with values and a huge character. They spoke of how involved he had been in their lives when they were growing up, and the bonds that he formed, not only with them, but the next generation of the family. Kenita remembers the close relationship that Gary had with her children. His nieces also remembered how they were sometimes on the receiving end of his jokes and shared memories of how the entire family would spend Christmas together and the tradition of sitting around the kitchen table playing cards. Gary took great pride in his appearance, never a crease out of place. He was a sharp dresser and used to joke, I still got it, ain't I? His home was equally immaculate, and he took great care to make sure everything was neat and tidy. That was the man that Gary Maunders was. He lived not at Grenfell Towers, as I said. He lived at 75 Lancaster Road, North Kensington. And on that fateful night, he had been together with his friend, Debbie Lamprell, in her flat, flat 161, on the 19th floor when the fire broke out. Sir, so you and the panel will recall from the presentation of the evidence in relation to Debbie um, by Mr. Friedman, Queen's Counsel, last week, that she had returned home from work at Holland Park Opera that evening on the 13th of June and was seen in the lift lobby about 22.57. She had texted her mum just after 11 confirming that she was home safely. Gary is not seen on the CCTV footage in the lift lobby area that evening, which would suggest that he had perhaps spent the day at the Grenfell Tower. The events of the night itself, the 19th floor. So you will also recall that Faduma Ahmed, who was living in flat 164, had left her flat after receiving a call at 1.20 from her cousin, telling her that the outside of Grenfell Tower was on fire. So it may be useful just to remind ourselves at this point of that floor plan from the 19th floor. Thank you. And we can see flat marked one, which is the flat uh, um, wherein Debbie Lamprell and Gary Maunders had been spending that evening at the time the fire broke out. You can see, sir, that flat 164 was on the west side of the tower. Faduma said that she saw Debbie and Gary when she came out of her flat. Debbie was standing opposite the two lifts near the cup cupboard doors and said that people were going upstairs. Faduma describes the conditions in the lobbies as follows. It was full of thick, dark gray smoke. It was dark and steamy and making it hard to see very far. She also said the smoke smelt like gas and chemicals, which burnt her eyes. Faduma recalls opening the door and going into the stairway, which had less smoke than the lobby at that point. She also recalls that they walked slowly up the stairs and they did not see anyone else between the 19th and the 23rd floor. Again, sir, we've heard extensive evidence about the upward migration of a number of people to the 23rd floor. We know that Gary traveled with Debbie Lamprell from flat 161 
up the stairs to the 23rd floor. And they were among a group of people that took refuge in Moses Bernard's flat. Debbie and Gary were initially standing in the corridor before taking refuge in flat 201. In her account, again, Faduma stated they were standing in the corner of the flat, crowded around the entrance door and the hallway. She said they felt trapped between the fire in the living room that had broken out through the window and the thick smoke coming in from the lobby. At some point, Debbie and Gary were separated. According to Debbie Lamprell's timeline, she made a 999 call at 0134 and 44 seconds, lasting around about a minute. That was connected to the BT exchange. Debbie reported being in someone else's flat, and it would appear that the fire had broken into the flat by that stage, as the caller is heard saying, Look, if fire is burning and there's a command to get the dog, get the dog, presumably that being Marley, Moses' dog, away from the fire. The call is somehow then disconnected and reconnected at 0139.22, this time lasting for a minute and a half. It is during this call that Debbie and Gary become separated from each other. The call does not appear to have been connected properly because the operator doesn't speak and instead it is an automated recording throughout. Debbie comes onto the call and one can hear her saying and calling repeatedly, Gary, Gary. The call then disconnects again and reconnects a few seconds later. This time it lasts for two minutes and 45 seconds. Again, it is the automated recording that we hear. Debbie continues to call for Gary and is heard saying, I'm telling you, no one's coming up. Whilst we do not know for certain how and why Debbie and Gary became separated, we do know from the timings of that BT exchange call that they were separated sometime around 0139. At that time, we also know that the conditions in flat 201, Moses, Bernard's flat, had been rapidly deteriorating. The occupants were affected by the impact of smoke and the ever encroaching fire. It would appear that the fire had broken into the flat at that stage via the window. Given the reported smoke conditions and fire, as well as Debbie repeatedly calling for Gary, visibility in the flat must have been exceptionally poor at this stage and dis significantly worsening. When at 0141 Debbie makes a further call, this time connected to the control room, she was in the bedroom and reported that she was unable to see because the smoke was so thick. Conditions in the lobby at this time. Gary and the other occupants were also being affected by thick black smoke from the lobby. The inquiry was reminded last week during the presentation of Rania Ibrahim of her Facebook live stream, which started around 0138 and ran for six minutes and 33 seconds. It showed the conditions inside her flat and the lobby and at around 1 minute 14 into the stream. It is worth noting and highlighting a few extracts from that stream, which may offer some insight into Gary's movements. The stream opened with Rania saying, oh God. We then hear another woman saying, don't open the door, don't open the door, you're letting smoke in. In Arabic, Rania says, there is a fire in the building. Rania then says, I'm scared, maybe someone's outside. Another female voice is heard saying, they're in another flat. Rania replies, are you sure? The female replies, 
They've gone to the other flat that was open. We then hear loud banging. And Rania opens her door again, shouting, hello, come here, hello, hello. Pausing there, if I may, I'd like to remind us all of the Phase 1 report, Volume 2, Paragraph 1132. At that paragraph, there is an image, Figure 11.9. One, one it's a capture from Rania's Facebook live stream at around this time, 0139. It's when she goes from the lobby from her flat into the lobby. The report says this in relation to that image. At this point, the camera is facing towards the lobby. A light in the ceiling of the lobby is on and the darkness is that area that appears to be caused by smoke. That image is striking in its starkness, an almost entirely black screen only illuminated by the blurred outline top and center of the lobby ceiling light, looking like some strange apparition caught on camera in the darkness. This is what the residents on the 23rd floor were confronted with in their lobby at 0139. One can only imagine their confusion, their fear, and their desperation. Returning then to Rania's live stream, Having said those words, hello, come here, hello, hello, we then hear Gary's voice. He says, and this is at 056 of the live stream, I'm here, I'm here. Rania replies, come, come, quick, quick. There's a response that's unclear from Gary. And then we hear banging and Rania saying, hello, here, here, here. Gary then responds, thank you. There's some discussion then between Rania and a male voice, not Gary's, about closing the door. But Rania is concerned that there may be more people outside and says again, come here. At that point, we can hear Marco Gattardi. He says, no, we are, we're here. We are inside my apartment. It's clear that... Rania is doing her best to try and find out if anyone else is out there in the darkness to offer them refuge in her flat. <coughs> Gary answers that call for refuge and with a banging noise, he follows the sound and he ends up in flat 203. There is then on the live stream, loud banging heard in the background, along with the sound of the vents. Farhad Nida, in his evidence, had said that he had phoned the TMO around about 10 past one because the vents were so loud. And he told us that they were positioned between flats 202 and 203 on one side of the building and flats 205 and 206 on the other. Given the timing of 0139, it is likely that the banging heard was Faduma Ahmed because we know from her evidence that she was banging on the metal door to the roof that was padlocked. She said she'd heard the helicopter and was banging the metal door because it was padlocked and she'd hoped that somebody could hear her. She described the smoke getting thicker and thicker in the stairwell until she could not see the stairs under her feet. One can make only informed guesses and inferences as to exactly what Gary did after saying those words to Rania on the live stream. It may have been the case that amidst the noise of the vent, Faduma banging on the metal door in an effort to attract attention, that Gary left flat 201 to investigate whether there had been a rescue. Being a non-resident, he would not be familiar with the layout of the 23rd floor and may have gotten lost trying to navigate his way through the smoke-filled lobby. Then hearing Rania's call for refuge, he took that up. Inside flat 203, 
again, from Rania's recording, we know that it continues after Gary goes into the flat itself, but he's not heard on the recordings after that, and he's not seen on any of the footage. During Rania's presentation, we heard of the deteriorating conditions within flat 203. Gary himself made no calls to the emergency services that night. It is important perhaps to consider the following key aspects of that timeline. At 2.05, Isra Ibrahim reported in a 999 call that smoke was entering the flat, so they had closed the doors and moved to the living room and the kitchen area. They had kept the windows open so that they could breathe, and the smoke was not entering through the windows at that time. At 0240, there was increased smoke exposure to the south face of the tower, spreading across flat 203. At 0242, Isra Ibrahim's 999 call, um, she reports that the smoke had now entered flat 203 from the lobby and from outside. They were now forced to close the windows because of the burning in the flat next door, 202. It is perhaps useful at this point, sir, to remind ourselves of Professor Purser's evidence and his analysis of the uptake of asphyxiant gases. Gary Maund had entered flat 203 around about 1.39, 1.40 a.m. And based on Professor Purser's evidence, he then became effectively trapped in flat 203 by the Smokeville lobby. During the two hour period up to 3.11, there was some slow smoke infiltration into the flat from the lobby, but Gary and the other occupants were able to avoid significant exposure by sheltering in less affected rooms and opening windows until the smoke started to flow past outside and the windows were closed. Once the exterior fire spread outside the bedrooms from around 0311 to 0320, there was increased smoke and toxic gas penetration into the flat. By sheltering in other areas, such as a living room, the occupants were able to limit their uptake to some extent by approximately 17 to 26 minutes later, around the time the exterior fire spread was now outside the living room, the occupants had started to accumulate a substantial, but not at that point, sub-incapacitating dose of asphyxiant gases. That would have continued until around 0350. From approximately 0337, as the exterior fire started to spread past and penetrate the living room on the south and then the west sides of the flat, and as the smoke and gases conditions in the room deteriorated, that deterioration would have been rapid. Professor Purser considered that had Gary and the other occupants of flat 203 attempted to evacuate at that time, 350, it is likely they would have collapsed after descending several floors. He bases this upon the um, COHB measurements of Abrifus Ibrahim, which was about 20% COHB at 350. That's a significant but not sub-incapacitating concentration. And his estimate of the high concentration of CO in the lobby and moderate concentration of, of CO in the stairs at this time. So what are we to make of that? As Professor Purser says, by 3.50, it is unlikely that Gary and the other occupants of flat 203 would have been able successfully to self-evacuate. Gary's remains were recovered from flat 203. The location of his remains suggests he died in the bathroom. The anthropological findings also indicated some signs of osteoporosis and age-related conditions. 
it's unclear from this um, evidence whether or not and to what extent this would have impacted on Gary's ability to self-evacuate down several flights of stairs from the 23rd floor. Professor Purser considers that he would have been sheltering when he died. He also considered by sheltering in the enclosed areas of the flat, furthest away from the rooms with exterior windows exposed to the fire, Gary would still have been exposed to the pe penetration of toxic smoke, but he would have been less exposed to heat, and it is most likely that he died before the fire consumed the flat. In terms of time of death, Professor Purser estimates that the approximate bracket for the time within which it is likely that Gary would have died is between 4.20 and 4.40. Dr. Feganel, the pathologist, agrees with that approach of an approximate time or window of time when recording deaths would be appropriate. As I said at the outset, Gary Maunders was not a resident of Grenfell Tower. He didn't live there, he was visiting. His family, therefore, had no reason immediately that night to be concerned for his safety. Why would they be? They were unaware that he was even there until they came across information and footage circulating on social media. That was a particularly cruel way to make that discovery. On the 14th of June, Kenita Spence reported her uncle missing to the Metropolitan Police Casualty Bureau. And thereafter, she and Chanel had the experience <coughs> similar to so many others that we've heard of in the previous module, of trying to find out accurate information about their uncle Gary and the difficulties they encountered in doing so. Gary's identif identification was confirmed via dental records on the 29th of June. In terms of the medical cause of death, the initial medical cause was confirmed by Dr. Benjamin Swift on the 27th of March, 2018, as consistent with the effect of fire. Now, Dr. Fegan Earl, in considering the appropriateness of recording the medical cause of death as asphyxia from asphyxiant gases or inhalation of such gases in the light of Professor Purse's analysis, concluded that given the limited pathological material available to him, um, he could not do so and that the appropriate medical cause of death to be recorded was consistent with the effect of fire. To conclude Gary's story, it is a particularly cruel twist of fate for his family that in doing something as innocuous as visiting a friend, Gary Maunders lost his life in quite terrifying circumstances. His family never got a chance to say goodbye. They never got the chance to tell him just one more time how much he meant to them, how much they cared about him, how much they loved him. But Gary knew all that, and his family must console themselves with that knowledge. His nieces have written a few more words to express, even now, five years after this terrible fire, how they still feel. You were loved by many. Nan's blue-eyed boy, literally. When you left, everyone's world fell apart. Nan passed of a broken heart. I hope you're all together now, in heaven, happy and at peace, catching up for all the lost years. Our love will never die. You will always remain with us until the day we meet again. Lots of love and kisses. We miss you, gal. One of our angels on earth, now an angel and a guardian angel to us all. You were the most selfless and kindness, kindest of souls, a true gentleman. I've so many beautiful memories that I'll forever treasure. You had and still have the ability to make me laugh, even in my darkest moments. 
I'm so proud to call you my uncle, my hero. You continue to live on. I'll never stop fighting for justice for you. I mentioned at the start that Gary loved music and he was a particular fan of Marvin Gaye. And I hope Gary would approve of me ending this presentation on his behalf with three lines from a song by Marvin Gaye. It's called, Hear My Dear, and he recorded it back in 1977. May love ever protect you. May peace come into your life. Always think of me the way I was. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Munro. <clears throat> that uh, brings to a conclusion the proceedings for today, <clears throat> but we shall be sitting again at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning when we shall hear more presentations on behalf of those who died. Thank you very much. 10 o'clock tomorrow morning.